What's up guys? In this video we're gonna take a look at the most anticipated game of the first super tournament of the year. Already a long sentence. I'm talking about the encounter between Wei Yi, the I believe 16 year old Chinese prodigy and the world champion Magnus Carlsen. Wei Yi has been the one who has come close to Magnus Carlsen's rating marks at a similar age. He's scared the whole world in 2015 by winning some brilliancies like the game against Lazaro Bruzon. And now it is time for him to meet the world champion for the first time in a classical game. Wei Yi with the white pieces against Mr. Magnus Carlsen. Here we see photographs of the players, if I'm not mistaken. And let's jump straight into the game. Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces meets e4 with e5. This is his main move. Knight to f3, knight c6, and where he decides to play classical, go for the main line, go for the Roy Lopez bishop b5. Carlsen decides against the Berlin, which he's played a lot, and he goes for the classical line with a6, bishop a4, knight f6, short castles, bishop e7, rook e1. All of this, no surprise by Carlsen, he's done this countless times. But here, uh, first small surprise, the move castles, he tends to play more classically, I keep saying classically, more old school with d6, c3, castles, h3, and his favorite line here is the Briar with knight b8. We've seen Magnus Carlsen employ this many times. But this time around he goes for my favorite line, the good old Marshal. He castles and after c3 he plays the move d5, sacrificing a pawn and trying to generate some initiative, also trying to get Wei Yi out of his preparation because Carlsen has done the marshal once or twice, most notably against Vichy Anand in Shamkir in 2015. But we're not accustomed to see him play it and I'm very curious if this is the start of a wonderful friendship between Magnus Carlsen and the marshal. c6, this is the main move, trying to keep the bishop, keep the knight on d5 to prepare bishop d6, then queen h4. All of this has been seen countless times, of course, for those interested in martial theory, I can recommend my video series on Chess24 updates or latest trends in the Marshall, whatever I called it. Check it out. D3 is nowadays the main move. D4, I keep explaining this, but I'll do it one more time. D4 has gone out of fashion. The difference is in this very line, Queen H4, G3, Queen H3. White has the idea of playing Rook E4, intending to chase the Queen away with Rook H4, but Black has a very strong move, G5 stopping that because bishop takes g5, runs into queen f5 with a double attack against these two pieces. With a pawn on d3, however, no such thing. Therefore, after bishop d6, rook e1, queen h4, g3, queen h3, white could play rook e4 with a very clear conscience because g5 can be met by bishop takes g5 and queen f5 is no longer a double attack. Therefore, Black goes for the main move against d3, which of course has its drawbacks as well, doesn't really occupy the center and so forth. He goes for bishop f5, a developing move, keeping his options open. And white, in order to finish his development without losing the pawn back, knight d2 would leave this pawn very loose. Goes for queen f3, hitting the bishop. This is a position still very well known to theory. Carlsen had it on the board against Anand last year. There he went for the little known move bishop g6, but did not manage to equalize and did not feel like repeating it. Other known moves are queen to f6 and my favorite, the move rook to e8, which has recently been employed twice by Peter Svidler, trying to use the weaknesses on the white back rank. But this time around, Carlsen goes for the main move, the move queen to h4, which is not really a piece sacrifice because queen f5 is not the greatest of ideas after queen takes h2, king f1, rook a e8, Black threatens queen h1 checkmate, which is very awkward to meet, and black is already better here. Therefore, you gotta go g3, stop the threat of queen takes h2, queen to h3, and we're still in the middle of a theory discussion. They used to take on d5 in this position, bishop d5, cd, queen d5, but practice has shown that after rook a d8, black has enough compensation, even for the two pawns he's down at the moment, he's normally gonna get the d3 pawn back, and then his active two bishops will save the day for him. Therefore, white has recently stumbled onto a new approach in this position, which is to keep it simple. Develop the bishop, give the pawn on d3 back, get the pieces out, and then try to get a positional advantage 
using the fact that the queen on a3 looks nice, but it's a little out of play for, I don't know, doing battle in the center. So bishop e3 is all the rage, bishop takes d3, knight to d2, and black is nothing better than queen f5, offering the exchange of queens, controlling the e4 square, because you don't want to allow white to go knight e4, bishop d4, and develop an initiative with his active pieces. So queen f5, all theory, bishop to d4, this bishop now sidesteps the exchange. And here Carlson comes with the first slight surprise. This is a position that has been seen a lot in high-level chess. Me personally, I'm not a huge fan from the black point of view. I don't think it's a big problem, but black has to be careful to equalize and typically has to be precise in a slightly worse position. Not my cup of tea, but the world champion came armed for this game. He plays the little known move rook ae8. The main move is rook fe8, which might look more natural because it leaves the f8 square as a safe retreat for the bishop, but rook a8 has a very specific idea, which we're gonna see in a couple moves. What white wants to do is he wants to prepare knight e4, which currently would hang the queen, so that explains the move king to g2, tending to jump here and hopefully manage to get a hold of the two bishops. Queen takes f3 was played in the game naturally enough as well, but in fact a novelty h6 has been seen in an earlier game, when after a4, white developed a bit of an initiative and managed to win in the game Maxim Vashila Graf against Mickey Adams. Knight e4, by the way, not yet a good idea because this piece would be captured. <clears throat> Therefore, a4 trying to distract white, and after queen f3, king f3, then this knight wants to jump into e4. So, queen takes f3 is Carlson's novelty. King takes f3, natural, you're still fighting for control of the e4 square. And here we see the point of his play and the point of putting the a rook on e8, not the f rook. It's to play rook e6 in this position. With a couple ideas. First obvious point, after rook takes e6, f takes e6 is check. That's why he left the rook on f8 and if white goes back with the king, black is in time to play c5. Note that now this pawn defends this knight and this bishop doesn't have any good square to go to. Black would already be better. Therefore, you can't really take on e6. Another point is if white plays a move I've been talking about all along, the move knight e4, black goes rook f8, and all of a sudden white is pinned along the e-file and bound to lose material here. Therefore, also not a good idea. Another move that tends to be not a good idea in all these structures is to play bishop takes d5. After c takes d5, it might look like black has a weakish isolated pawn, but a more important factor is his pair of bishops and his new gain, newly gained control over the e4 square, therefore also can't be recommended. So white has to come up with something and Wei Yi sank into very deep thought here, thought for, don't let me exaggerate, but something like 45 minutes trying to find a recipe and he came up with what I think is a very good idea because there is really nothing direct you can do. If you try something like a4, Black goes b takes a4, bishop takes a4 and c5, once again emphasizing that this bishop doesn't really have anywhere to go. If you try c4, both of these typical moves to break open the structure on the queen side. But here this knight gets a very nice square on b4, eyeing c2, so also can't, can't do it. Therefore Wei Yi plays the very quiet move, and I believe the move that surprised Carlsen, the move rook a c1. Not showing his hand yet, but hinting that he wants to prepare c4. And he's also saying, you know what, I don't think you have a useful follow-up to your rook e6 move. And he has a point, because if black goes rook f8, which looks natural, then white can take on e6. Now f6 is no longer checked, doesn't make a lot of sense. And after rook takes e6, we see the point of rook c1. Now c4 is pretty strong, opening the queen side and creating some chances there. Therefore, Carlson had to come up with a good waiting move himself, because there's nothing obvious to improve the position, he decided to go with h6, naturally enough, creating a luft for the king. Another move that I believe deserves serious attention and that we might see in future games is the move a5, intending to go a4, chasing this bishop away from its nice b3 square. Carlson went h6, once again saying, okay, you went rook c1, I'm still not scared of c4, play move please, sir. And where ye Followed in the same way, in the same vein, went king to g2. Once again, a waiting move might look strange because you're no longer fighting for control of the e4 square, 
but it's more important to create the threat of rook takes e6 when f takes e6 is no longer a check. c4 was still not very impressive. This time, I believe the easiest way for black to play is to play c5, ignore it, and counterattack when after cd5, rook e1, rook e1, black goes c takes d4, and such a position after knight e4, easiest bishop e4, rook e4, let's say rook c8. No matter what your computer tells you, this is pretty much a dead draw. There's absolutely no way white has to make progress here, in spite of his extra pawn. Black just goes g6, king f8, and does nothing. Therefore, I like where he is to move here, rook c1, and now king g2, and he manages to ask some questions, because now Magnus Carlsen has to do something about ideas with c4, and in general, the awkward situation of running out of good waiting moves. Once again, rook e8, rook e6, followed by c4 is a problem. And if black played a5 now, then rook takes e6 has to be met by f takes e6, which might not be the end of the world, but it's still something you don't want to do. Carlsen decided to play very directly, and I believe correctly, the move rook to g6, pairing the threat of rook e6 and introducing some ideas with knight f4 check or bishop f4 of his own. The drawback, of course, that this rook might end up being out of play, and also he is once again relinquishing control of this important e4 square. That's where Wei Yi goes. He goes knight e4, bishop takes d5, might be an alternative now with the rook slightly misplaced, but it still doesn't scare me. After bishop e5 here, which would be logical to exchange these dark squared bishops, black can either go bishop c5, which I think holds, or play more directly, bishop e4 check, knight e4, d e4, Bishop d6, rook d6, rook e4, and rook d2, when his active rook should ensure the draw in spite of being a pawn down. So where he goes knight e4 and Carlsen shows the idea of his move rook g6 check, a forced line knight f4 check, king to f3, once again forced, and bishop takes e4 check. Now normally you don't want to do this, you don't want to give up this bishop unless you really, really have to, but here there's some direct ideas. The knight gains access to the d3 square, after rook takes, this is what we're going to see in the game. Well, king takes is very possible, but the king on e4 is a little too central for his own good. And once again, maybe black could go c5, counterattacking against the d4 bishop. If this bishop were to go away after bishop e3, rook e8, king f3, and knight d3 is a bit of a problem. Double attack against both these rooks. Can't do it. And therefore, Wei Yi went rook takes e4, allowing knight d3. And here he shows his preference for active play compared to passivity and sacrifices the pawn with the move rook to d1, which I don't think is objectively better or much inferior to the more passive move, which I probably would have chosen the move rook to b1, just defending the b2 pawn, when Carlson would probably follow up with c5, bishop e3. And with this knight on d3, he shouldn't be in too much trouble, but still black can go bishop c2 after, let's say, c4, and still ask some questions. c4 might be a mistake. The computer indicates a very interesting option, king h7, to unpin the f-pawn and go f5, go after this rook, when play would still be quite sharp, but white has the two bishops and could maybe still put a bit of pressure. Wei Yi doesn't want to wait around, though, and he goes for activating his rook with rook d1. Carlsen, of course, grabs the pawn. That was the idea. Knight takes b2 and rook d2. Now we can see this knight is a little far away from home. If black played the most natural knight c4, after bishop c4, b c4, white would go bishop e3, reclaim his pawn on c4, and have a pleasant advantage, because the black pawns are a little weaker than the white pawns, and black would have an unpleasant defense ahead of him. Carlsen doesn't want to do that, and he plays the sharply calculated bishop to a3, putting both his pieces quite far away from the action, but he's spotted that there's nothing that white can do to use this. White doesn't have pawn breaks on the queen side right now, and that he can maintain the balance like that. I do not think that Carlsen considered his position to be better here. White is too active, and if a rook landed on d7, black would have to be very, very careful. That's what way he wants to do, and he prepares it by getting his bishop out of the way, plays bishop b6, intending to go rook d7, target the weakish f7 pawn, but Carlsen is up to the task, goes rook d6 before the rook makes it all the way here. 
Rook takes d6, bishop takes d6, and it's time to take stock. Black is still a pawn up, which is good. White has the two bishops and active pieces, especially this knight on b2, is not a very promising piece. Objectively, I believe the position should be more or less equal, and here I think where Yi commits a small inaccuracy. He goes for the move rook to e2, attacking this knight, but this knight now has a way out via d3, and then e5 would check, which I think should, should not have been granted. Rook d4 looks like a good alternative, controlling the d3 square, hitting this bishop. Bishop e5 looks obvious, counter-attacking against the rook, and now rook to d7 once again intending to put some pressure on the f7 pawn when bishop takes c3 would be too greedy running into bishop c5 and white is on the attack therefore the best black has is to play knight c4 here blocking this bishop off and after bishop takes c4 b takes c and let's say bishop d4 remember this position we're gonna see something very similar in the game later this position is equal the black pawns are so weak that his extra pawn doesn't matter Instead, Wei Yi goes for rook e2, attacks this knight, knight to d3, as mentioned, is now possible. Rook d2, knight e5 check, the knight made it out alive, king g2, bishop e7. Black still has an extra pawn, it's a very unusual scenario. What you typically see in the marshal is black being a pawn down and having the two bishops trying to make a draw. Here he's a pawn up, but white has the two bishops and tries to make a draw. Where Yi keeps playing actively, goes f4, trying to chase this knight away, and once again to gain access to the d7 square. And now the knight continues his journey, goes to c4, under slightly better circumstances than we've seen earlier. The king is far away, f4 sort of weak in the second rank. It is white who has to make a draw here. Rook d7, the rook final or one rook finally makes it there. Bishop to f6, however, counter-attacking against the c3 pawn. And there's the position, which looks very similar to the one we had earlier with the bishop on e5 and the king on f3, where white would like to play bishop d4 to neutralize this bishop, but he can't do it because black has sneaky little move to move rook to d8, and the tactics work in black's favor. If white has to exchange rooks here, now black's extra pawn is really starting to count. There's no easy way for the king towards the weaknesses on the queen side and black could start really pushing for a win. Wei Yi has a good spider sense, a sense of danger though, and he finds a stronger move, the move rook c7, trying to liquidate by going after the black queen side pawns. This looks like it could lead to an instant draw after bishop c3, rook c6, but Carlsen is a world champion because he keeps finding chances in even the most innocuous of positions here, instead of dropping this pawn and shaking hands, he goes for rook b8, trying to activate his rook. When rook takes c4, would lose a pawn. This might still be a draw, but rook b6, rook c3, rook b2 check, followed by rook takes a2. It's nothing you wanna defend against Magnus Carlsen. Where he finds a stronger move, he goes a4, trying to send reinforcements and also getting his pawn away from the second rank so it can't be captured after a later rook b2 check. Carlsen keeps finding some resources, now he plays bishop b2, once again stopping rook c4 and preparing to push his pawn even further. This is move 39, one move before the time control, and here Wei Yi makes a small inaccuracy. The move he should have played is to play a5, fortify his bishop on b6, and after c3 just to do pretty much nothing. Go king f3 and ask black how are you intending to make progress, which the answer is black can't really make progress. White is intending to go bishop d4 or bishop e3, and there's very little black can do about it because he also has to keep an eye on his weakness on a6, let's say king f8. White could already remove his bishop with bishop e3, or he could just bring his king closer to the c-pawn, and he maintains active, enough activity to keep the position in the balance. Set bishop a5 was played, also logical, attacking the a6 pawn and stopping c3. But Carlsen spots another chance. He gives this pawn up immediately and has spotted that in this rook ending, which looks like a dead draw, he still remains the slightly stronger side because he's the first to attack the a pawn. And that means that white has to go passive and defend it with his rook a5, rook b5. This is a tricky spot. Do you want to put your rook passively? 
on a3 to defend the pawn or do you want to activate it but give up a pawn? I don't know what the best answer is where Yi decides to go for passive defense with rook a3, rook b2 check and king a3, also not ideal but you have to keep your h-pawn alive. When it looks like Carlsen has created some chances, he now plays f5 locking up this king stopping g4 and it's not so easy to defend such a position but where Yi does not get rattled, plays a move rook c3, now a5 was not on priest so he can activate his rook. Carlsen has to immediately attack the pawn to stop that activation. Rook b5, the rook goes back to a3. Now the problem is this rook can't stay on b2 and b5 so you have to allow either g4 or the activation of the white king. g5 is Carlsen's attempt to keep putting pressure, f takes g, h takes g and this king gets out of its jail by going king to g2. When white is still slightly worse but every pawn trade as the one made in the game signifies some progress because the less pawns there remain the higher is the drawing margin. And in that same vein after king g7 where Yi plays a very strong move, the move h4, offering the exchange of a further pair of pawns, which if you do that the position is just a draw, there's not enough winning material. So Carlsen has to go g4 keeping pawns on the board but now the problem is that white has a passed pawn on the h-file which should the black king ever get too ambitious and make his way over to the queen side will be a very significant factor. Still the game ain't over, white still has his passive rook to deal with and Wei Yi wisely decides to activate it and give up a pawn now that he has a trump of his own. Passive defense might have worked but it is playing a bit with fire because the white king also doesn't want to go too far away from his weakness on g3. So I like his decision here, rook c3, rook takes a5 and rook to c6, cutting off the black king along the sixth rank and should the king yeah, move over then once again the h-pawn will have its say. Carlsen tries to push his a-pawn instead but Wei Yi once again shows that he's done his homework. The only thing you don't want to do in such a position is bring your king over to the queen side because after let's say king f1, a3, if you go for, <clears throat> even this is a draw, I'm trying, ah, this is a, a losing move. If you go for king e1, if you go too far, then black has a breakthrough with f4, g, f, g3 and the two pass pawns will decide. For example, king f1, rook f2 check, king g1, a2 and black follows up with rook b2, rook b1 and wins the rook. However, as long as the king sticks around on the king side as Wei Yi does with king h1 there's very very little black can do to improve his position. Carlson went king f7, king g1, rook a1 check. If you start marching with your own king as mentioned white can wait a little further and should the king get too far away then you can start pushing your own h-pawn h5, king b7 and even h6 probably works here. King takes a6, h7 and white would get a new queen. Therefore not much that black can do to improve his position where he has correctly evaluated this is more or less a fortress, a draw, Carl's maneuvers a little bit with his rook and then plays king e7, king h1, a3, king g1 and the game ends because there is no way to make progress as mentioned king to d7. White can just keep waiting king h1 and should the king go here First of all he could still wait or he can start running with his h-pawn. Therefore Carlsen realized the kid has defended well, no further progress can be made and a draw was agreed in this position. Which yeah, I believe is a success. <clears throat> For Wei Yi he's survived his first game against the world champion, even put some pressure outside of the opening by playing some pretty good moves in the form of rook ac1 and then king to g2 after h6 pose Carlsen some problems then yeah he lost the threat a little bit and had to be precise in the rook ending in the end but he was and he managed to hold himself with with the white pieces against the world champion which I believe he's gonna be quite happy with. Thank you for watching this video, check out our live coverage on Chess24 of the Tata Steel Masters, still many games to go. 
Become a premium member on chess24.com if you want to support the site. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye.